Welcome to Black Hat 2021 Virtual Hacker Summer Camp live with Security Weekly. I'm your host, Adrian Sanabria, and this is the first micro interview we have today. Joining me is TJ Null, Community Manager at Offensive Security. Welcome to Security Weekly, TJ. Thanks, TJ. Uh, thanks, Adrian. It's really great to have you here. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm excited about this one. I was just uh, off camera, uh, off air, was was saying this could easily be an hour because <laughs> we we uh, there's some similarities in our background and and some stuff that isn't similar. And I've got a bunch of questions for you, but yeah, generally uh, we're going to be talking about the importance of community and and learning in infosec, uh, some some career stuff, and I do some mentoring. You know, so this is this is huge for me because the way I came up is not the way other people are coming up in security these days. You know, it's very, very different uh, from what I remember, you know, 20, how I got into it 20 years ago, which was from IT was the most common way. Now you've got people coming straight in from school, uh, you know, working in, in socks uh, like you did, TJ. Yeah. Um, so for me, really, you know, starting out, you know, getting into high school was, you know, starting with computer tech classes was where I got into it. I mean, I guess, Adrian, for you, you know, back in the day, it was always going through forums or IRC channels, right? Um, and nowadays, it's really changed for a lot of people who want to get into this field where, you know, you could be able to get an internship, you could be able to get your certs, right? And I mean, I've even seen some you know, students that come out with their certs right out of high school, you know, either with having an OSCP or even getting, you know, some of the other fundamental certs that we have in this field. Yeah, it's massive having those skills coming straight out of high school. I can't imagine. Yeah, it was mostly like like zines and you know, as you said, uh, you know, IRC uh, spent some time there, forums and things like that, uh, email even. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, talking about certifications, um, you spent a lot of time with the OSCP, you know, both uh, training for it, you know, and helping other people uh, study up for it. How important is that particular certification to the field? And, and is there anything else out there really like it? Does it even have any competition these days? That's a very good question. So for me, preparing for the OSCP, you know, I spent four years of my time, you know, just dedicatedly trying to prepare for it. You know, I wanted to get comfortable learning some of the skills um, that was needed, and also some of the tools and the different techniques that the course had talked about. Um, so going through a lot of that stuff really gave me an idea of, you know, how some of the tools work, right? And how to be able to use some of the different syntaxes for them and also the techniques that they talked about in the course. And there was a lot of open source material that I'd find and also, you know, challenges like um, over the wire, right, with Bandit and Natus that really kind of helped me get started to learn more about, you know, Linux or different web apps which I think was really great. Um, and now looking at it, you know, with OSDP, I still think OSCP is still the number one leading cert, you know, just trying to get started into pen testing, right? Or trying to get a career in pen testing. Um, there's other competitors that are, that are out there in this world, but I think what really makes OSSEC unique is a lot of the systems that they have in their lab environment are are really real world, you know, that you get to experience the practical applications that you go through. Um, and seeing in the new version of the PWK, um, with the amount of material that they put in and going through a lot more chapters, I wish I went through that one instead of the previous version that I had. Yeah, I, I was I was definitely for a long time die hard. No, you you know, security is not an entry level field. You can't go straight in. You, you've got to have this huge foundation. You, you got to go work as a sysadmin or a network engineer or something like that. Get this this big foundation of of experience first. Uh, I, I actually remember training some pen testers where they'd be like, okay, I got into a database. Now what? You know, they didn't know any SQL or anything like that. And uh, and that, that kind of reinforced that belief I had for a long time. But definitely willing to admit um, that things have changed and I'm wrong on that front. How, how do you feel about, you know, whether it's necessary to have IT experience before getting into security versus uh, going straight in? You know, are, are folks going straight in disadvantaged? I think a lot of people who are trying to go straight into pen testing are at a disadvantage because the big things that we need to know being a pen tester, right, we need to have the prerequisites of like networking fundamentals, right? Or having yeah. some knowledge of actually how to program. And also to mention having understanding of different operating systems. Um, for me, right, I didn't start as a pen tester coming out. I started working in IT, then I was a sysadmin. 
And then building that up, I wanted to get into the blue team side first, just to understand, you know, how defenders and inter-response um, employees would actually go through and try to look at some of the incidents or see what hackers do. That way I was able then to build my skills to become a pen tester and understand what our defenders looking for, right? Um, so I think is, well, I shouldn't say I think, right? I encourage people who are getting in this field to start going through the fundamentals, but also to start a job in IT, have a job as a data assist admin. Um, those are really going to be great places for you to learn stuff instead of going straight into being a pen tester. Because when you be, you know, try to go straight into the pen testing field, right, and become that pen tester, you're not really going to have an understanding of some of the stuff that sysadmins have to deal with or IT people have had to deal with, even network engineers. So. Yeah, I think there's a, an appreciation you get. And how I how I got into IT, actually, is I registered a domain, and it was right when broadband came out. We were all moving from dial-up. So I had this always-on, you know, massive bandwidth of 1.5 megabits per second DSL line coming into my, my apartment. And I uh, actually ran my own website and my own email server off my broadband at home, which probably sounds insane uh, today. But, you know, you learn a lot of those stresses about, you know, keeping things up and running, you know, and, and uh, when you're in the pen testing side, you, you can relate. You're like, oh, yeah, I've made that mistake before. You know, I know what to check for because I've, I've been there and I've made those mistakes. And uh, on the other side, you can exploit them. Yeah, I mean, for me, when I start, before I started becoming a pen tester, um, I actually had my own home lab set up. So when I worked at the college as a sysadmin, um, our goal was basically to build our own cyber lab because we were going to start teaching students cybersecurity. And one of the really cool things about it was that I got to learn about, you know, Active Directory services, spinning up, you know, VMware ESXi and running my own vSphere Manager um, system as well, too, to manage all the different servers that I had with all the virtual machines running. And then started getting to the network side, right, you know, setting up your own firewalls, having stuff connected into separate sub-networks, right? Trying to build all that stuff out, I think, was a huge benefit for me. And I think that's something, you know, that people need to learn. And there's a lot more opportunities now that people can start building out their own labs, whether it's being on site, you know, trying to get that old piece of hardware right and bringing it back to life or even trying to spin some stuff up in the cloud as well, too, you know, with some of the uh, cloud environments that or sorry, cloud platforms we have out today. Yeah, there's free tiers out there and you can take advantage of that. Absolutely. So you went beyond certifications. You have an, actually have a degree in cybersecurity. Is that something you would recommend for most folks? How do you feel about, you know, kind of the, the traditional um, career or, you know, secondary education path? You know, is, so, is that, was it worth it? Regrets? So for me, um, I got my associates, I have my bachelor's and I have a master's certificate right now. Um, and I think for me, having a bachelor's and associates really did help. Um, it did give me the career that I'm in, but that's how I look at it at most is just, it was a piece of paper in the end. Um, a lot of the courses that I went through in my undergrad degree really didn't teach me some of the technical stuff or trying to apply a lot of the hands-on stuff that I wanted to learn. So a lot of the time when I was taking my classes and going through the material in those classes, I was also taking you know free time out of myself to start learning more about you know different operating systems right spending more time in Kali Linux um, and also going through you know some of the other books that they didn't teach about as well too in those courses um, and we still have that today in the education um, industry right for cybersecurity where people are still teaching by the books and I mean like we're teaching like with old books still that we have no one's teaching up new stuff no one's going through and actually starting to learn with, you know, how to be able to build their own virtual machines or customize their own network infrastructure or environments. We don't really have that. Most of the time um, when I was at uni, it was basically writing research papers, you know, and they would be like 10 to 15 pa papers, you know, going over, you know, some of the NIST frameworks, right? And that was really it. I didn't actually get to spend time, you know, building like, you know, a, you know, a full entire infrastructure or lab environment that I wish I could have done. So, so, but maybe, the, maybe you got some writing chops that could be important when you're a pen tester, right? Oh yeah. The writing chops, of course, you know, you, you have to always write reports, right? You know, and you have to make sure that the style that you're writing is also good. And also to make sure that a non-technical person who is going to be reading your report understands what you're doing, you know? So I did get a little bit of benefit out of that, I would say, but overall though, um, like I said, it had its ups and downs in the end, you know, this having the degree was great. Like I said, it got me through the career. 
Um, do I wish I could have learned more from my te from my professors and also through the courses I was in? Yeah, absolutely. And try to be more hands on. And that's what I would like to see continue, you know, with other universities. And that's what I try to challenge with, you know, some of the universities that are starting their own cybersecurity program. So as a community manager, uh, could you explain a little bit about uh, your role uh, for offensive security and, and, and what you what you do in that role? Yeah, absolutely. So being the community manager for offensive security allows me to try to make a balance where I try to help out any students that have any issues with OFSEC or try to make any type of clarifications. And the biggest thing for me is mentoring. And um, I try to find ways where I can try to get anything that's on security or infosec, you know, in the offensive security side, right, of cyber, um, and try to help explain that better for people who are getting started in this field, you know, or want to have a better understanding of what offsec has to offer, whether it's courses, right, the open source um, tools, right, and resources we offer as well, too. Um, so those are my big things that I try to do, you know, running a community uh, for offsec and also trying to build relationships with people as well, too, that want to get in this field. Right. So you also seem like you're really big into competitions, into CTFs. Uh, is that also something uh, you recommend uh, for people trying to get into InfoSec? You know, I, I guess phrased another way, does getting better at CTFs make you better at InfoSec or does it just make you better at CTFs? That's a really good question. So my free time when I was in uni, right, was actually doing cyber competitions a lot. And one of the big competitions that was always big for me was CCDC. Um, so the Cyber College Gate Defense Competition that was ran um, and getting to actually experience um, full time pen testers and red teamers go up against us and trying to harden the systems as a blue teamer really was a big thing for me. Um, I still compete from time to time, just seeing what people have when challenges they create and also to get an understanding of why were they created, because then I can learn about certain tools that I can go ahead and use, you know, to apply in my real world practices of what I do. Um, so I do see a very huge benefit of getting into CTFs, um, you know, doing these cyber competitions. Although a lot of people do say that, you know, a lot of stuff that you learn from CTFs may not apply to real world. And it's true. But at the same time, you can use the stuff that you learned to be able to teach others about some of the certain tools you go through or certain things that you see in these CTFs. Um, I wish there's only one thing I wish better is that CTFs would be able to share you know some of the challenges and the write-ups that go with them you know so that yeah. other ways you know people can learn about these challenges and then for people who are creating challenges for ctfs to help mentor and educate you know students that want to get into cyber also learn to maybe create their own challenges you know using some of the stuff that they have learned from these challenges that other ctf vendors or you know competitors right you know host and learn yeah i mean i'm a huge fan of the blue team style CTFs. And it's a total coincidence that I'm, I'm wearing my, my open sock uh, t-shirt today from, from DEF CON last year. I uh, had a team that uh, competed in that. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, throw, you know, those are pretty realistic scenarios they, they put together. And uh, though they're using open source tools for it, uh, you know, the process is, is very similar, you know, having to learn those query languages, how to, how to find uh, logs and events and alerts. Uh, and, uh, you know, find IOCs and stuff like that, you know, di dig them out of packet captures and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So <clears throat> also open source. Um, I don't know how much you use Kali in, in the community stuff you do, but uh, just curious uh, how you'd answer this question. Um, what is it you love most about open source software? And, but then also, what's your biggest pet peeve when trying out what looks like an exciting new open source project for the first time, but you know maybe you run into some issues? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I like to use open source tools a lot because I can under, because then I can look at what you know that developer or person who's contributing to the code to for that certain project right, is doing. And what's really nice about it is that, you know, I don't have to look at closed source projects, right? Or have to, you know, go through some of the battles that we have you know, using certain software. If there's something I could take from that project, right, and implement it into Kali and test it and run it, you know, I could be able to do that then, which is nice. And, you know, the other thing about it too is that, you know, seeing so many people in our field, right, create so many amazing tools that have really helped us out you know, with a lot of work that we do in the field. 
And so with Kali Linux being started as, you know, a big project where, you know, trying to grab all of these pen testing tools, red team tools, right? Any type of other security tools, you know, that come together, you know, so that other people, you know, can just download an ISO, right? Run the operating system and their tools and the suite that they need are there, um, I think is really great. And Kali does a really great, the Kali team does a really great job with trying to be open with the community about what certain tools are in there, right? They also provide so much documentation on what you can do with Kali Linux as well, too. Um, and to see a lot of, you know, those tools come together that people have written, right? You know, it can be a rewarding thing, you know, for some people to see that, oh my God, my tool's in Kali. This is really cool that other people can use this, right? Um, you know, there are some hurdles that we go through, you know, trying to use some certain tools, you know, some certain tools need, you know, certain packages, right? That depend on it. And there can be old packages that might not work, right? And it's, can be a pain trying to get some of those packages or try to find some of them uh, to try to make their tools work, which is another big thing. Um, and I don't think, and then, you know, another issue that comes to my mind is that a lot of people really don't get a lot of credit, you know, so I'm, I'm going to call out, you know, tool contributors and developers that, you know, release their open source tools. They don't really get a lot of credit from the community, you know, because a lot of companies, right. And a lot of pen testers and, you know, even blue teamers, right use their tools, but no one really likes to give back at certain points. I mean, you have a few people that will, right, to right, contribute, right. right, add some stuff to it. But most of the community that I've seen, at least, hasn't really shared a much information or details or documentation or what they could do to help try to improve, you know, some of the main tools that are out there. Um, that's why I like to see, you know, people like Bite Bleeder, for instance, right, when he started uh, Porchetta Industries, you know, he started to go ahead and make, you know, Track map and some of his other tools become sponsorware tools now, where people can actually be able to get the latest releases, but by also you know giving some like the type of money right or funding, um, you know to be able to help you know contribute to his work because it's a lot of free time that he puts in to build and make those tools. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a challenge. We've seen open source projects over the years uh, struggle with that challenge. You know, sometimes maintainers just get burnt out and. Uh, call it quits, you know, and sometimes somebody will pick it up and fork it and sometimes not. Mm -hmm. So one last question for you, a bit of a non sequitur. Um, what is it about Al Simmons that attracts you to his character? Uh, is, does he embody the hacker mindset or is he just a cool comic book character? <laughs> I am a huge fan of Spawn. Um, I really like the work that Tom McFarlane has done with the comic book series. Um, and a lot of the stuff that, is in the stories, like some of the evil villains, characters, uh, and Al Simmons, right, being the main character of Spawn, right, uh, is implemented in my tools and my tradecraft. So um, there's some certain people that I know in this world that like to, you know, use Star Wars, right, or they'll use right. uh, Star Trek, or they'll use like you know, Lord of the Rings, right, as some of their stuff. Um, so Spawn is the reason why that all my tooling or my techniques I use is based off the stuff in that comic book itself. So you yeah. may see my Al Simmons user basically running on Windows environments sometimes when I'm doing pen tests. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and if, if you're not involved in some community thing and you find Al Simmons on there, you know, it's it, it, maybe you just had a pen test from TJ. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, no, it, uh, I, I just noticed that I was a big Spawn fan. Also, it's actually one of the first comics I got into back when I got into comics. It was right when it was coming out, and I still have the first 18 uh, issues. That's awesome, yeah. I have, um, I literally, I just finished getting my whole collection for the 300s uh, series, um, mm -hmm. and I have a C2 framework that I've written uh, that's based off of Spawn's evil villain, Horizon, as well, too. That I don't know if I want to publish or not. That's that's still something I've wanted to look into further doing. But, um, but it is a great comic for people who like comics, right? Go check that out. Go check out Spawn. Yeah, definitely. TJ, thank you so much for joining us on Security Weekly. And to learn more about offensive security, you can go to securityweekly.com forward slash offsec, O-F-F-S-E-C.